Hello AP Calculus AB students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School and welcome to video two covering topic 3.3, derivatives of the inverse functions. Now, don't let my Bitmoji's facial expression kind of turn you off of this particular idea because it looks like I'm a little mad about this process, but really I'm not. In fact, what I'm mad about is how sometimes this topic is painted with a brush that gives students ideas that it's a lot more difficult than it has to be. And sometimes teachers even think of it in that regard. But when you really get down to the roots and the nuts and the bolts of it, it's actually a fairly easy topic. And it's a fairly easy question on the AP exam that you all are going to be able to get correct, despite the fact that it typically has a pretty low percentage of success. So I want you guys to be those students who get this question right in this upcoming AP exam. So let's take a look at our example two for the derivatives of an inverse. Now, hopefully you had a chance to tune in to video one over this particular topic, which outlined method one. Now, method one was pretty nice because we could find the inverse of a function by switching the x and y and solving for the new y. But in method two, we don't have that luxury. And as you can see, it's outlined up here that says this method is used when finding the inverse of a function is either difficult or impossible. Now, I want to preface those words because finding the inverse is really never a difficult thing to do. You just switch the x's for y's, boom, you've got your inverse. What I'm talking about here is, is finding the y value alone, rewriting that inverse so that y is by itself. Let's say that that is what we feel like is impossible with this problem. And if you look at the example two really quickly before we outline the steps, we can see that if we want to find the derivative of this inverse function f of x equal x cubed minus 4x squared plus 7x minus 1 at x equal 1, we have got our hands full. Because we can start the problem by interchanging the x's for the y's, which is exactly what's outlined here in step one. And I We'll write that off to the left side here. x is equal to y cubed minus 4y squared plus 7y minus 1. That's easy. What's difficult is pulling off the algebra to get y by itself because this is a cubic expression on the right side. So we're not going to have to worry about doing that, but yet we can still find the inverses derivative. Now, how do we do that? Well, we move on to step two, which says find dy dx implicitly. Ah, so that's why we studied topic 3.2, or one of the reasons why you studied topic 3.2, finding derivatives implicitly, because you guys don't have to have your y all by itself to take a derivative. We have that wonderful tool. So to take that derivative, I'm going to rewrite this in a in a weird way to kind of set the stage here. And it's very typical that students may not write this step. I don't require my students to do this. I demonstrate this maybe once or twice to get them understanding what I'm about to do. But it's so important that we understand we are taking this derivative with respect to x. So if you come across an x, business as usual, but if you come across a y, take that derivative by tacking on that multiplier of dy over dx. So in this case, we have 1 on the left side, of course, but the right side's where a lot of action starts to happen. The derivative of y cubed with respect to x would be 3y squared times our dy over dx. We continue the derivative of minus 4y squared is minus 8y multiplied by dy over dx. Keep it a going. The derivative of 7 times y is 7 multiplied by dy over dx. And then we come across our constant 1 whose derivative we know is 0. So we've taken care of step 2 fairly efficiently. We go on to step 3, which just says, hey, solve for that dy over dx. And just to point out, it will be in terms of y. So the best way to do that would be to factor out the dy dx on the right side. And I'll go ahead and show the steps for this. It's very likely that if you're a very astute student, you might be able to do this in one step instead of the two that I'm going to use. But there's my factoring of the dy dx. And then I'm going to divide over that, that 
that uh, trinomial there. And as I do that, I'm going to use the second column here. And also, I'm going to get the dy dx on the left side, if you guys don't mind. And so I would have 1 on top, and then 3y squared minus 8y plus 7 on the bottom here. Okay? Now, as I said in my last video, that dy over dx is like asking for a little bit of extra recognition. He's like, hey, I don't mind you calling me dy over dx. I think that's really okay. It's just that I would rather you call me something that's a lot more oh, indicative of what I really represent. And that is the derivative of the inverse. So really what this is, is just f inverse with that prime mark around it. and I know that it's a little bit tricky when you say, oh, f inverse of x. Well, wait a minute. I have y values over here. I, I wouldn't really worry about that right now because what we want to do is be able to evaluate this particular derivative um, at some given x, and that's what our next step is going to be. Okay? And this is the part that can be a bit tricky, so you want to pay real close attention here. Step four. It says that you want to replace the value of k. Now remember, k is just some given x. So right here in this problem, that 1 is a very specific x that we're going to call k. So you want to replace the x in your inverse function from step 1 and solve for y. Well, here's our step 1, the starred step right here. And so it says we're going to take 1 and we're going to plug that thing in for the x. Well, that gives us something kind of interesting here. It gives us a very tricky equation that's very difficult, if not impossible, to solve by hand. Now, I want to talk about this a little bit because sometimes these equations look like they're impossible to solve by hand, and in reality, they're not. Now, because this particular problem, as you can see off to the left, has the calculator icon, it really doesn't matter if it was a difficult one or not because we're going to use the calculator to solve it. In some later videos, we're going to talk about how you can actually solve certain equations like this if the calculator is not allowed to be used. So you want to stick around for those particular problems later on. But since we're allowed to use the calculator, let's whisk on over to our calculator software and take a look at this equation. All right, and here we go with our calculator software. Now, I'm going to actually use the TI Inspire CAS version uh, software here, which will allow us to solve this in a way that uh, maybe a lot of calculators out there won't allow you to solve. But I will revisit the way that, let's say, you would solve this on a non-CAS calculator uh, like the Inspire Numeric or possibly the TI-84, which is a wonderful, very popular calculator out on the market. So stay tuned for that here in just a moment. But to solve this with CAS, one thing that you can do is you can actually go into an algebra menu and choose the option Solve. And this is a really cool feature because you can physically type in that equation just as it appears on our paper. And if you remember, it was 1 equal y cubed minus 4y squared plus 7y and finish off with the minus 1. Now, just a little syntax issue with the TI Inspire CAS is that you have to tell the calculator what variable you're solving for. It doesn't seem like there's many options here. We're going to go with a comma y. And once we do that, I'll move my face out of the way here. And we have the answer 0.349371. Let's move myself down here, let's say. Now, that's wonderful. That will work well for us, and we will um, use that particular value here in just a moment. But say, for those of you who would not be able to solve this using a solve feature like this, what you would have to do is graph uh, a function where this equation would be set equal to zero. Now, two things. You would probably want to subtract the one over, so there would be a minus two here in order for this to be set equal to zero. And it's likely that you're going to want to change that variable from y to x. It won't make any difference in terms of the outcome. It's just going to allow your calculator's function menu to use this. So let's say that you're using a graphing approach to this. Um, whether it's the TI-84 screen, you'd have like a, a y1 equal in your uh, 
um, in, in your particular model there once you hit the Y equal button. And so you would type this in. Again, you're changing all those Ys to Xs. So you have X cubed minus 4X squared plus 7X. And remember that minus 1 at the end is going to be joined by another minus 1 to make for a minus 2. Now when you graph this, you're knowing, you're realizing that y is equal to 0 here, right? So you're going to be finding the value of that 0, uh, which is right where the graph crosses the x-axis. Looks like it's going to be about what we calculated. And on the Inspire, we can go into Menu, Analyze Graph, and we'll choose option one zero if you're using a t84 you use something very similar um, to find the zero and in this case we'll select a lower bound somewhere to the left the upper bound we just sweep over to the right and boom that point shows up and if you want more decimal places you can just hover over it and you can hit the plus button to add more decimal places so that's the value 0.3494 i'll take it out to four decimal places so that um, I can ensure a little bit more accuracy perhaps later on with my answer. So let's go ahead and return to the document and throw that in there. So we've got our value from before and y is going to be, we'll say approximately because we know that we had to round it, three, four, nine, four. And it's, it's going to turn out, you guys, that I don't really need that fourth decimal place because I'm going to use the most accurate version of this answer in a moment when I go back to the calculator. But by and large, it's always a good practice to round your values to at least four places, more is even better, in the middle of a problem on the AP Calc exam so that your final answer is most accurate to three places at the end. So our final push here is just simply a matter of saying, okay, well, if we want to finish this off, we'll go to step five here. It says plug that value of y into your derivative. So from a notation standpoint, it's going to look a little something like this. The derivative of the inverse evaluated when x is 1 is going to give us 1 over, and we would just take this expression 3 times that y. Well, instead of using y, we're going to plug in 0.3494, and of course we'll square him. And then we subtract 8 multiplied by 0.3494. And we finish up with plus our 7. Extend this fraction and, you know, the OCD in me. I've got to center that 1. You know that. So we're going to go ahead and use our calculator and evaluate this to finish off this answer. So here we are on the home stretch. And I'm going to go ahead and input that derivative value by hand. There are ways that you can have the calculator uh, manually do that for you. And I might talk about that in a later video. I'm just more concerned about making sure that we enter the, the value correctly here. Uh, so if you remember that uh, value, that, uh, that expression for a derivative was 1 over 3y squared uh, minus 8y plus 7. And then I'll move on to the outside of that so I can do a such that, control equal such that bar. And the really cool thing here is that we don't have to manually enter that value for y. Since we just computed it up here, I can push my up arrow, hit enter to kind of copy and paste it to many decimal places of accuracy. And then when I hit enter again, I'm going to get my final answer, which we can report as either 0.218 or round it up to 0.219. And that would be our final answer. What this answer represents would be the slope of the tangent line drawn to the inverse specifically when that x value is equal to 1. Now before I close out this video, there's one thing I want you to kind of key into as it's going to lead to a really important idea coming up in uh, one of my future videos over this topic. And that is taking a look at the relationship between a couple of things. I would like for you all to take a look at this highlighted portion of that derivative, 3y squared minus 8y plus 7. The next thing I would like you to do is take a look at the highlighted portion of my original function f of x. Hopefully you can see the relationship there. The orange 
portion is just the derivative of the yellow portion. Okay, yes, the variable switched, but that's probably having a lot to do with the idea of the inverse. But if you can see that the denominator is just the derivative of the original function, that's highly important. Oh, and I might point out that numerator is 1. And if you took a look at an earlier video, we talked about how the slopes of these particular tangent lines to a function and its inverse have this reciprocal relationship at their sister points, a comma b versus b comma a. You put those two ideas together, you really got your foot through the door to understand the third and final method, which is typically the surefire method of which the AP exam may ask you to compute the derivative of an inverse. So we definitely want you to stick around for that. Anyway, I hope this video has been helpful, and we'll see you next time.